Coming up next, I'm going to give you five great tips from a wonderful entrepreneur that will help you, and then how the pandemic has prompted a shift to the tech industry and how we can help you. We'll take your calls starting right now. I am coming to you live from Ramsey Solution Studios in Nashville, and you are joining a conversation about who you are, what you were created to do, where you want to do it, and how you can get there. It is about your purpose in and through your work. You were created to fill a unique role. That means you are tremendously valuable and you are needed. You have a duty to show up. And be the best version of you because there's somebody on the other end of your gifts. Now, the three gifts that we look at to help you get clarity on who you are and what you were created to do are your talent, talents. That's what you do best. Think abilities and qualities, hard skills, soft skills. Your passion, we define passion as the work you love to do. It's not about notoriety. It's not about money. It's the work itself. You love it. There's high emotion and high devotion when you're thinking about it and when you're engaged in that work. And then the final gift, your mission. These are the results of your work that matter deeply to you. All work creates results. And we all long to contribute with our work results that affect others positively and also reward us emotionally. So talent, passion, mission. Where those three gifts intersect, that's your sweet spot. And in that sweet spot, there are multiple jobs and multiple career paths. This is what a purpose sentence looks like. You use what you do best to do work you love to produce results that matter deeply to you. So if you're watching right now and you're saying, Ken, I have no idea what it is, you're in the right place. If you're watching right now and you say, I, I know what it is, but I'm dealing with fear and doubt and pride. They're holding me back. I say to you, welcome to the club. You're a human. But you can't overcome those things, and you're in the right place. Or if you know what you want to do, and you don't feel you're being held back by those enemies of progress and enemies of purpose that I just laid out, you just simply don't know how to get there. Well, you're in the right place. So let's do this, a conversation about your contribution 844-747-2577 844-747-2577 you can call right now i'm sitting here waiting madison is standing by she'll get you on we've got a couple of phone lines open and we're here monday through friday so as you gain that courage watch today know that i'm for you and we are here to give you clarity you have the answers it's my job to get them out of you also while you're watching give us a thumbs up if you're enjoying the program subscribe if you haven't we're growing very rapidly here on youtube and we're so excited and grateful for that share the message because we're doing a different kind of talk show no politics we're talking purpose and we all united around that so here we go i love to share relevant data and stories with you as we open the program every day and i got a great story my kids uh, the coleman kiddos We've got three, 14, 12, and 11. And one of our family shows that we love to watch is the Shark Tank. Uh, and it's fascinating to me how uh, this has been going on for several years. Uh, at their young, tender age, they really love Shark Tank. And I've gotten to know Damon John and Robert Hershevik, uh, sharks that are on the show. And they've told us that that is, in fact, the case. Children love watching the show. But nonetheless, recently, Kendra Scott, uh, who is the founder, uh, CEO of the self-named jewelry company and now has expanded into other items she founded the kendra scott brand and now it's over a billion dollars in value and uh, business insider great great uh, uh magazine and online content provider recently interviewed her and i saw this and i wanted to share some things with you who are wanting to start something or you've recently started a side business you've got that entrepreneurial bug in you. And this is going to really encourage you because sometimes I think that you think that you're the only one doing this and you're the only one experiencing some of the stuff you're experiencing. So here's some great recommendations from Kendra Scott. Uh, I mentioned that she uh, founded the business. This is her take after being on Shark Tank. She said, the American dream is still very much alive. I agree. This is her story. She launched a jewelry business 
uh, in 2002 out of a spare bedroom with $500. Pretty glamorous, isn't it? I kid. Then she convinced local, I love this, that this, this is the law of the zip code that I write about in my best-selling book, The Proximity Principle. The first place to start, there's five places I write about in the book. The first place is where you are. Call it the law of the zip code, which says you have everything you need to get started already around you. Kendra Scott got this. She starts in a spare bedroom with $500 and begins the process of getting her jewelry in local boutiques in her zip code. Eight years later, she opens her first store in 2010. It was on the heels of the Great Recession. In 2016, six more years later, she sold a minority stake of her company to the famous Warren Buffett private equity company, Berkshire Partners, at a billion dollars. Folks, she sold a minority stake, not the whole company, a minority stake for a billion dollars. Uh, that was a good day. Very good day. Do you think, by the way, when she's realizing this, I'm not talking about when they're negotiating. I mean, like, when the deal's done and they hand her paperwork, she sees the signature there. She's going, I just sold a minority stake. After all the crap I've been through, after all the fear, after all the doubt, after all the rejection, I just sold a minority stake of my company for a billion dollars. Now she's in 100 stores and growing across the U.S. Here's her advice. I'm going to roll through these. Because these are self-explanatory. Number one, she said, build the business first and fundraise later. Her mentor advised her early on, focus on developing the, st the startup before you try to get fundraising. And what we're talking about here is equity. Now, can I just throw my two cents in there? I would say, build the business first and don't even assume you're going to need fundraising through investors. Don't just assume that. Now, if that's, if that's a very viable option. But the point here is build the business. Prove it. Make sure that it works in your zip code. Number two, know your numbers. Um, if you're not good with numbers, hire a good bookkeeper, a good accountant who is great at the numbers, and let them figure out a spreadsheet that you can understand. You have got to be aware of the numbers, what your revenue is, what your expenses are, what your margins are. This has got to be stuff that you just know. And if you watch Shark Tank, those sharks pound those people. They got to know their numbers well enough to explain that it is a solid business. Number three, show your passion. Customers, investors are looking for enthusiasm. They're buying your passion around the product or the service. Uh, number four, your identity is your strength. Listen, you are the heart and soul behind the business. Your experiences, your failures, your perspective are important are important don't shy away from sharing your identity don't lose your identity and then finally protect your mental health entrepreneurship in my opinion is one of the most difficult journeys on the planet it's tough you're the chief everything officer you've got deep passion in this and when things don't go well uh, our customers don't bite it right away it is wildly discouraging but you can do it but you've got to have an outlet. You've got to have time for yourself, even if that's 15 or 20 minutes a day. You've got to have what I call your real board. And those are men and women in your life that are objective and that you can speak to, be vulnerable, insecure, break down and cry. And they're the kind of people that will smack you in the face and say, snap out of it. You got this. I believe in you. Come on. Or, hey, let's hug it out got to have those people in our life on these entrepreneurial journeys. So great stuff there from Kendra Scott. I hope that helped those of you who want to start something or who have started something. All right, let's get to the phone, shall we? It is your show. 844-747-2577 is the number. Let's go to Sonny in Dyersburg, Tennessee. Sonny, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. I can't. Thanks for having me on. You bet. How can I help? Okay, I'll tell you my situation, then I'll ask my question. The question will be, should I stay in the situation or try to change it? Okay. That would be the question. All right. Um, I'm a preacher. I'm 25 years old. I love doing that. I've worked through the sweet spot exercise. I definitely know I want to do that, mm -hmm. but doing the exercise I also found 
I'm drawn to mathematics, financing, uh, finance, stuff like that. So I went through FCMT. I'm a Ramsey preferred coach now. I love it. Very excited about it. And I'm actually teaching a biblical finance seminar at my church in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. So that's great. Uh, the problem is I did your career guide and I'm in the wrong role in the wrong position currently at my job and I don't make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to decide, should I just hold tight as the financial coaching grows? Mm -hmm. Cause I know I have a lot of connections with that. A lot of pastors, a lot of stuff to where I could get in front of people and help for sure. Mm -hmm. Or slow that down and put more energy into finding another job for now. And then build the financial coaching. All right, let's start with you took the should I quit my job quiz, which is free at KenColeman.com mm -hmm. for those of you who want to get this. And I love the report and it spits out four scenarios and you got a uh, wrong role, wrong place, correct? Right. Okay. So what's the role at your church that you're filling? Right now, I'm not a pastor or anything. I'm just helping my pastor. I fill in at some other churches, do some youth camps, periodically just fill in here and there. Well, that's not a full-time job though, is it? No, no, that's not the job. I work at a factory. Oh, see, the day. I, okay, brother, I'm confused. The way you made that sound, you go, uh, I'm a preacher. I'm called to preach, and I know I want to do that. But you didn't tell me about the other day job. So let's go back. You're working in a. <laughs> right, you, right. See, you see how I'm confused? Right. Okay, what's your day job? I just work at a factory. I make a uh, pet product. Okay. All right. That makes total sense. But you feel called to preach, yes or no? Absolutely. Or called to yes, ministry. Never yeah okay now let me tell you this as a pastor's son uh, and my wife's a, a pastor's daughter and both of our dads at different times during their ministries they were bivocational right so i want to put that out there that i think that that bivocational is a viable option if you feel called to ministry the question becomes do you feel called to be a senior pastor, do you call to just be in ministry on a church staff or a parachurch ministry? You, you know, that's what you have to figure out. But you could certainly be on a pastoral staff or on a uh, ministry staff or parachurch ministry staff and also do the financial coaching on the side. So that's a viable right. option. So how does that sound to you when I just kind of throw that at you? That sounds pretty good. I'm definitely open and committed to the bivocational thing. What I'd like to see is I just kind of help my church, not as the pastor, but I help him kind of a, a really good number two. And I have my own ministry on the side where periodically I travel around, uh, hold some more seminars kind of like this on several different subjects. And I'd like to see more of the day-to-day -day of helping people with financial coaching yeah to me that's the so dream. like pairing up with churches yes yep. to, to me that's the dream job is that you are successful at running your own financial coaching business that's the dream right okay so what i would tell you is on the day job where you're just in the wrong well it's obvious to me why it, and it's a day job mm -hmm. by the way so here's mm -hmm. my take on the day job, because this is actually, I'm really glad that this is the, the scenario we're dealing with, because I need to clarify this for those of you, we have new people joining the show all the time. I'm fine with you being in a day job and staying in a day job if it is simply, it's my base. It's my, it's keeping me stable while I am doing the things necessary, getting qualified, getting connected. And those are stage two and three of my seven stages. And so once mm -hmm. a person's clear and you are clear, Sonny, then right. there's two options on the day job. Cause I'm fine with you staying in the day job, but you just got to change your mindset to go. I'm not going to walk in miserable anymore on Mondays. I'm going to walk in with great attitude and effort because this day job is what is funding my future. Do you see the right. shift there? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm fine with that. Now, here's an, uh, another option. I'm also fine with you getting another day job where it is more enjoyable for you. And you are at least getting closer to the sweet spot in the sense that you're, you're doing something you're good at and you enjoy the work. And I would say that in this economy, we just saw some more numbers today 6.9% unemployment. Uh, the economy is absolutely responding like we all knew that it would after the artificial suppression around the globe because of COVID-19. 
and and and, and mm-hmm. even with COVID nineteen in a you know rebound, if you will, the economy's still adding jobs. So option A is you stay in the day job and you change your attitude. Option B is you go, wait a second. I, there's more things I can do in Dyersburg, Tennessee, where I, maybe I'm in the I'm in the the right role and in the right place, or uh, at least I'm in the right role and the wrong place in this situation would be it's not the dream job, but we're okay with that. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. It does. So I think you got to do what's best for you right now, mentally and emotionally, when you feel like you're in a dead end job. So the question becomes, and and you don't have to answer this. You've got to think about this over right. the weekend. The question becomes, can you shift your mindset on this current day job? Or do you go, you know what? I can find a better day job where it's a better fit for me and still make the same amount of money I'm making or maybe even more while I'm building my financial coaching business on the side because the financial coaching business is going to have to replace your current income. And anything Mm -hmm. you make from the church is gravy. So that's my take. Right. Right. You got it? Absolutely. All right. Hey, let me hear a little juice in that answer. Sonny, do you got <laughs> Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. You know what to yeah, do. Yeah, I do. I've answered your question, correct? Correct. All right, my man. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Thanks, man. Yeah, you bet. Listen, this is a good reminder of one of my favorite lines from one of my favorite movies of all time called The Great Debaters. And it's a it's a scene in the movie between Forrest Whitaker, great actor, and his son. And his son's on on the one of the top college debate teams in the country. And he's all about debate. And this kid's brilliant. And and he's all about debate, 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 debate. And he's rushing out of the house. And his dad's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Have you finished your homework? Have you finished your studies for tonight? And the kid stops. And he's kind of doing that thing that kids love to do. And they roll their eyes and and he basically looks at him and says, do what you have to do. Then you get to do what you want to do. And what a wonderful, wonderful line that is. What a wonderful reminder it is for those of us who are in a day job that we cannot stand or a day job that we're just bored and stale. But we've got this dream. But the money component to this journey, folks, is huge. And we must be stable. We must be smart in how we go after the dream. We don't need to be jumping off cliffs. That's never smart. That All that romantic crap that only exists in the movies. Oh, I'm just going to I'm gonna quit today and walk out, tell my boss to shove it. Now I'm chasing a dream. Okay, great. By the way, that only works if you've got money in the bank or something to walk into. Uh, other than that, you're going to wake up about, you know, middle of the night around 2 or 3 in the morning panicked. Because you realize how dumb and stupid what you just did was. So, come on, folks. And and so, if we can shift our focus to, wait a second, if I don't have any viable options in the day job, I can change my mindset. And we know from neuroscience that what we think about affects what we act on. So, it's like I say to my three kids, hey, do your best forget the rest. And what I'm telling my kids when I tell them that every day is you give good effort and have good attitude. And if you're struggling in a class, I get it. But guess what? You gotta complete it. That's how that works. So parents that are in that situation, step back for a moment and go, what would I tell my kids if they were me in this situation? You've got this. 844-747-2577. Let's go to Miami, Florida. Lynette is on the line. Lynette, you're on the Ken Coleman Show. Hi, Ken. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Well, it's my pleasure. What's going on, Lynette? Ken, I need your advice. I'm so blessed. I just came back from maternity leave, and I was promoted to manager of my department. Hey, hey, hey. All right, all right, all right. I like that. So blessed. It's been eight years and I've worked my, I've worked so hard to get there. Yes. And I've had coworkers that I've been with them for six, probably seven years, all maybe all eight years. And they've been my friends. We go to lunch together. We share personal stories and now I'm their manager. Mm -hmm. Now I'm in charge of their performance and now, and not only my performance, but their performance as well. Mm -hmm. 
So I just wanted your tip, your advice on how can I talk to them and let them know, you know, I'm still your friend. I am your manager now, though, and I'm going to delegate responsibilities. But, you know, I don't want the environment to change. I don't want them to hate me or I just want your advice on that. Yeah, great question. Okay, first things first. Um, You don't just tell them that you're still friends with them. Show them by doing whatever it is you guys always did. I would go to the same lunch with the same group of people. I think that's wonderful. It would, just because you put on the leader hat doesn't mean that there needs to be this barrier. Mm-hmm. Um, that is such a ludicrous and mind-numbingly stupid uh, conclusion that a lot of people make. Oh, well, once I go to leadership, I, I can't fraternize with the people. That's so dumb. Mm-hmm. So I think the first thing is don't change any of those habits. You said there was a group of people that you guys went to lunch with and hung out all the time. Is that correct? Yes. It's the people I work with. They're now going to be, you know, reporting to me. And nah, we stop, always have lunch stop, together. stop, stop. you got to stop thinking of them as now they're reporting to me. You've already yeah. got this thing up in your head. Here's the deal. You're, you're Are they right. still the same people that they were before you got this promotion? Yes. Are you the same person that you were before the promotion yes okay then so nothing needs to change as far as the personal interaction what will change is the professional conversations that you will have that's what's changing but here's the key to this i would meet individual with every one of them and go i'm so excited about this and i cannot even tell you how excited i am that i i get to lead this team because of how well I know all of you and how much I love all of you. And I just want you to know our relationship isn't changing. In fact, I think it's going to get better because I know that if I help you all win, I win. And it's so exciting. So my job is not to tell you what to do. You are not reporting to me. We are working together. We are a team and I want to help you win. And so I'm so excited And I want to start with, hey, let's work together and let's come up with a one-page description of what you think uh, is a win for you in the job and what you have been needing from leadership. And, And then let's make sure that we're clear on key responsibility areas and measurements. And my number one role now is to help you win. And you got a friend in the leadership position. And I care deeply about helping you win in your job. Now, what do you think that sounds like to them? Sounds perfect. That's what I would want to hear from my own manager. By the way, you just said it all. You need to be to them what you have always wanted a manager to be to you. That Mm -hmm. becomes the litmus test. You are so smart, Lynette, and keep it to that. Write it on your mirror. Put it on your desk. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's true. I know. You. It's the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Treat people the way you want to be treated. You have been following leaders for a long time. Write yes. down on, a, on one sheet of paper all the things that you appreciated. And then do a line down the middle on the other side of the paper. Write down all the things that you thought were wrong and drove you crazy and we're not honoring people. And that becomes your never do list. But people make leadership so complex and folks, listen to me, Lynette, listen to me. It's about Mm -hmm. serving. And when they feel like you have not changed at all relationally, that's 90% of the deal. The other 10% is you making sure they know that now as their leader, you are serving them and you just want to help them win. And you want them to speak into what winning looks like in their role. And Lynette, you're going to be the greatest leader they've ever had. And your friendship will actually grow. So there you go. Thank you so much, Ken. You bet. Thanks for the call. Oh, I like those kind of calls. Folks, leadership is actually really simple but it's also really hard wait a second ken you're all confusing now what's going on is the medication wearing off no 
Leadership is hard because you are dealing with people and we people are messed up. And when we're messed up and hurt, we say and do dumb things. And, and managing and leading people will always be really, really hard emotionally on you and mentally, but it's actually simple. What makes it hard is that even though leadership is simple in that you serve and you cast vision, you guide, it's also as far as the actual act of what you need to do and how you need to do, it's fairly simple. But it does not mean that it is going to be an easy journey because it is not. It is not for the faint of heart. But keep it simple. And keeping it simple in what you do and how you do it as a leader will allow you to excel and get through the hard parts of leadership. That's what I'm saying. So just a little extra nugget there. 844-747-2577. Let's go to the chat room. And then uh, I've got an update, uh, some more great information about the massive shift happening in our economy and around the globe. People saying, I want to get into technology and why I'm so excited. I'm doing the excited hands, the Will Ferrell move from uh, – Wedding Crashers. You know what I'm talking about? Remember that in the velvet robe? You know, he was very excited. It's one of my favorite all-time moves right there. I'm very excited about our partnership with Bethel Tech because it's going to really help this shift. All right, let's go to uh, the chat room. I love that Madison was basically the only one that knew the move, but that's that's fantastic. Uh, Mark writes in, have an opportunity to make more money as a CNC operator by completing a certification. However, I'm very nervous to try because of my dyslexia. What should I do? Oh, this this is near and dear to my heart because I've got a child who has dyslexia and this is tough. It's hard stuff. Um, but it is a challenge that you know, Mark, that you can't overcome and you have overcome it. And I want you to draw from your experience and I want you to draw from the toughness that you've developed getting through school with dyslexia. Because unfortunately, in America, our schools and our teachers and our classrooms are ill-equipped to help kids with dyslexia and adults with dyslexia. It's unfortunate. It's not an evil thing. It's just there's not been enough attention on this because those dyslexic minds are our brightest thinkers. And they're not dumb. But unfortunately, the one-size-fits-all... Uh, conveyor belt education that we do in this country can really, really harm and really hold folks with dyslexia back. So you do have some experience. You do have some toughness. You're going to have to go in and go, no, wait a second. This is another test. This is another course that I've got to take. The difference is we're now in the real world. We're outside of education. Education's a bubble. You're in the real world. I would say to them, listen, I got through school. I got through college or whatever education you've gotten through, but I do have dyslexia. Here's how it affects me. And so I need to let you know this, but again, I've got all this experience and here's how I would have to take tests and just be open. Say, look, I can do this, but on the, some of these testing things, there'll be some things. So I just want you to know there's a way for you to know that I got the information and pass it. I'd be really open about it. I'd take the elephant out of the room. See, when we don't, when we don't address the elephant and then, and then the elephant shows up, let me give you an example. It's, it's a silly example, but it really make the point. <laughs> Let's just say that right now, here I am live on YouTube, and I'm talking. And let's just say that all of a sudden an elephant, a stuffed animal elephant just dropped from the ceiling, just hung about right here. Everybody watching goes, oh, that's weird. A stuffed elephant just came out of the ceiling and is hanging over Ken's left shoulder. That's what everybody's thinking instantly. Everybody watching goes, what's the deal with the stuffed elephant? But let's say that it's hanging there for five seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, and I don't even address it. I just keep on going. The elephant's right here, and I'm not addressing the elephant. What happens for everybody watching? Nobody can pay attention to anything I'm saying. It gets to be awkward, weird. Does Ken know there's an elephant there? Does he know there's an elephant there, and he's going to tell us? Or he knows there's an elephant, but he's not going to tell us. What's the deal with the elephant? And all anybody can focus on is the elephant. So if you've got dyslexia or you've got some type of uh, uh, a challenge, we've had we've had moms call in for their sons who have uh, 
uh, uh, autism, but but they are highly functioning in autism. But there are things we had a we had a mom call in one day. Uh, we actually had a guy call in who has Aspergers. He's like, Ken, here's the deal. I'm qualified. I know I can do the work. Uh, I've already done all the training, but I've got this social stuff that happens because of my Aspergers. So what have I told those folks? Tell people right away. Take the elephant out of the room. Hey, I've got dyslexia, but it's not going to affect anything other than some of the testing elements. Oh, great. It's like me going, oh, there's an elephant right there. That's an accident. We wanted that to come down later in the show. It came down. We're going to go ahead and pull it down and put it away. And everybody goes, oh, okay. I mean, you know, I mean, that's the deal. So we've got to get to a point where we take the, we acknowledge the elephant and everybody goes, oh, okay, great. But it is when we don't acknowledge it and then it pops up and everybody starts getting tense. And here's what we know about the human condition. Very few people are okay with confrontation and tension. And so when confrontation and tension arise, they just go, oh, I can't do it anymore. I got to shut it down. And they'll discount you. And they won't give you a chance. And they won't hire you because it makes them uncomfortable. So own it. Own it. And then everybody goes, oh, okay, no big deal. All right, let's go to Angel. She says, uh, what is an exit interview and why would I need to do one? <laughs> okay, uh, I am not a fan of exit interviews. Some people are. Do we? Before I go off on this, Bob, uh, do we have exit interviews at Ramsey? I believe we do. Okay. Yes. Well, I got to be careful. I don't want to say too much more. Uh, they are helpful. They are functional. Okay. Um, so Angel's asking, what is an exit interview? It's like you've decided to leave and either they've let you go uh, or you've decided to leave and HR or your leader wants to have an interview with you and they want to ask you questions about the organization. Um, they want to be able to be clear. Are you clear on why this isn't working out? So many things are covered there, but it's basically a, before you leave, we want to have another conversation. That's what it is. Um, I'm not a fan of them um, as it relates to uh, disgruntled people feeling like they got their last shot to fire something, but they are helpful. So I should clarify, they are good. They can be done well. And I know at Ramsey, we do them well. Uh, I just was unaware of it because I've not talked to anybody, but I know that we are really trying to extrapolate helpful information. Um, but uh, when you say, do you need to do one? That implies, and this was why I reacted the way I did, that they're giving you the option. Now, if you feel like it is a healthy situation and they're going to give you some valuable feedback, then I would do it if it's your option. Um, but you got to weigh that. And I don't know your situation. Okay. Cause there are some times where if it's a toxic situation, I don't know how much good's going to come out of that. So that's my hesitation if it's your option, but if it's something that, that they do and it's part of the HR and you leaving, you know, with no marks on your folder or whatever, then I do it and go through it. So it depends on who's, Who's doing it? But this feels like this is your option and, and you got to decide, do I feel like there's something good that could come out of that? 844-747-2577. Okay. Uh, real quick, new, new information coming out. And, and this is so relevant to our new partnership with Bethel Tech. Uh, many people are considering a career change and they're choosing to shift their focus to the technology industry. And this started at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, people are realizing the advantages of moving into the tech sector because of the ever-shifting nature of the economy, but technology is always going to need to be filled. And that's right. Because as as my friend Ryan with, with, with Bethel Tech said uh, early this week, he said, Ken, every company is a technology company. It doesn't matter what industry. They have to be engaged with technology for the consumer, whether it even be a nonprofit, a ministry, or big business. Every organization is effectively a technology company. And so tech jobs are always going to be relevant and always going to be in demand. Uh, and here's what we're hearing. The tech industry is always complaining about a skills gap, saying that they've got more roles available than there's talent to fill them. Here comes Bethel Tech and the Ken Coleman Show. We're taking care of that. 
Bethel Tech, amazing partnership. So excited about this. BethelTech.net slash Ken Coleman for more information. But I asked their CEO, Ryan Collins, to join me in the studio just a couple weeks ago. And we recorded some conversations, specific questions for you, my audience, who are going, I think I'd be interested. But Ken, is it possible? Can I afford it? Can I do it in a limited amount of time? The answer is yes. $15,000, nine months later, 85% placement rate by Bethel Tech. And they're not only training you on tech, they're going to train you on soft skills. They're going to mentor you along the way and they help place you. Are you kidding me? These are the kind of relationships that I'm excited about. And the response has been great. People are calling them. People are going to the website. But I want you to hear from Ryan Collins. Listen to more of our conversation right now. All right, Ryan, I'm so excited about our partnership together because you're doing more than just training tech skills, which is valuable enough. But the fact that you're helping people really become that complete team member through the soft skills and the faith-based training, which is going to make them even more attractive in the workspace. I want you to describe the unique edge that Bethel Tech is going to provide these folks. Yeah, it's really interesting. When we launched our program almost three years ago, we're the first ever Christian faith-based coding boot camp in the world. And one of the unexpected impacts was that, uh, well, we knew that you know churches and, and uh, ministries would be interested in working with us, but we're three and a half hours east of Silicon Valley. And we had the leading tech companies in the world invite me out to talk about our program. Um, as a baseline, you know, we focus on our in-demand tech skills like software development and data science, and data science and UI UX design. But what they were really interested was the fact that we focused on character. So things like a uh, healthy relationship and community, uh, brave communication and conflict resolution, accountability, nobility, trust, um, uh, culture of honor. And so these things are things that we know, these are all based on biblical principles, but they're also the same types of soft skills that they're investing millions of dollars to improve workplace culture. So that we got invited to these companies, not just because of the, the tech skills, but because of the soft skills. And, and that's what they're looking for. I had a, a CIO, uh, tell me recently, he's like, look, Ryan, I want high skill, but I also want high character. And if I had to choose between the two, if I had, let's say an A um, skill level uh, coder or technology or a C in terms of their character, and, and I reverse that and I had A character and maybe a C uh, in terms of skill, I'd take the high character person over the high skill uh, person any day of the week because I can teach them the skills once they're in here. I can't really teach them the character like you guys can. So that's what we appreciate about you guys. And uh, they see us as the first ever values-based, purpose-driven boot camp in the world, which is super exciting. It's super exciting and it's really important because it makes them more valuable. The folks are going to come through your program. And I've said this a million times on the show, folks that nobody cares where you went to school. The last time you went to the doctor, you didn't ask the doctor to pull his diploma off the wall and tell you where he went to med school. You just believed that he was a doctor or she was a doctor. And, and I think that that's what's so great is that the credibility that you have in Silicon Valley, because of the uniqueness of your training, the holistic approach, it's such a game changer. We talk about that all the time, those qualities that make you promotable. You're training those qualities yeah. on the front end. I love it. We've got a special Ken Coleman show discount because I'm a man of the people. <laughs> Ryan, tell them about the discount and where they go to get signed up or at least get some more information about how Bethel Tech can get them where they want to go. Yeah, absolutely. You can go to BethelTech.net slash Ken Coleman, and we're offering a $500 tuition reduction to anybody who comes to this channel. So maybe that's you. Maybe this is something that's stirring your heart. You're like, I'm ready to get into the tech space, and this is how I want to start. Maybe this is your son or daughter or family friend or, or whatever. Uh, we just encourage you to get that out there, and we'd love to talk to you. We'd love to learn more about your personal prep and professional goals and, and lock arms with you to start this journey. Folks, listen to me. You're nine months away from an unbelievable ladder that you can climb for the rest of your career. I don't know why you wouldn't at least go to Bethel Tech and talk to them and get the opportunity to learn more and more and more about where you can end up. You got to go right now. Trust me, go. All right, folks, these are the relationships that, that I've told the team. We've got to have partnerships like this so that as we're giving people advice and helping them get clear on what their dream job is, that we can point them to people that can help them in areas where I can't help them. And I can't train you in technology, but I vetted these folks. What a great company, 85% placement rate, nine months, $15,000. And let me just give you the context, folks. If you go get a computer science degree, you're looking at 180 grand. Yeah, I'm, I'm letting that sit for a second because some of you fell out of your chair and four years. Some of you are going, that's the problem. 
I know that. I, I can't do 180 grand. I'm not going to go into debt for that. I'm not, I can't do four years. I'm 35 years of age. I got three kids, two dogs, a couple goldfish, whatever the situation is. But I can tell you this, you can come up with, you can save 15 grand. You can cash flow your way through that with a second job delivering pizzas. Nine months? And folks, you're talking about jumping into a $65,000, $75,000 a year job, uh, maybe even six figures out of the gate, but within a couple of years, you're on that ladder and you're relevant in the economy no matter what happens? Are you kidding me? I'm telling you, folks, you decide. I'm not selling you a product. I'm showing you an option that I know is delivering the goods. Bethletech.net slash Ken Coleman. Call them. Tell them I told you to call and ask all the questions. Put them underneath the lamp, the heat lamp. Do your due diligence. But I'm telling you, for those of you that want to move into technology, hey, parents, you got some kids that you know don't want to go to college. You know they're probably not a good fit for college, but you know they're tech whizzes. Why wouldn't you? Talk to Bethel Tech. This could be the springboard for your kid. And let me just address one other issue. You're worried about what other people are going to think at the uh, cocktail party or the or the block party, if we ever do that stuff again. You're worried about what other people think. Did Junior go to college? No, he went to this nine-month program, but uh, he's got a job making 60 grand. You think they're going to be impressed with you and your kid? Yeah, they will. Because their kid's eating ramen noodles and got student loans they can't afford and a degree they can't use. Come on, parents, wake up. Wake up. This is a great option. I'm so excited. So uh, again, BethelTech.net slash Ken Coleman. Call them, talk to them. Uh, you're going to find out that this is a wonderful path for you or somebody that you love. All right. My time is almost up. But before I let you go, remember, you do matter. You do have what it takes. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time, this is The Ken Coleman Show. Press on.